I ask you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we're uh, looking at, like I said, uh, we'll be looking at the command in verses uh, 6 and 7, but I want to start here in, in chapter 2, verse 5, and ask this question this morning. I'll read the text, and I'll ask the question. Uh, it says, For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And so we see in Paul here what rejoiced his heart. So the apostle <clears throat> is speaking to us about something that caused him to rejoice, something he delighted in. Uh, we sang the song, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. So the appropriate question for us to consider is what things did you rejoice in this week? So you can be reflective for a moment and think, what are some of the things that brought you joy? I think we've been talking a little bit on Sunday nights when we talk about sharing the good news, uh, that one of the statements we all need to become kind of familiar with and want to do is just really is, is what is the good news and start using that in your workplace with your co-workers, with some unsaved family. Just start asking them what the good news is. I think Charlie mentioned a few weeks ago that he asked that at work, and some of them looked at him and said, there is no good news. Everything's bad news. Well, is it really? All that thrilled your soul this week was bad news. Nothing thrilled me this week. Well, that's not reality. There's something in which you took pleasure this week. Maybe you should have, maybe you shouldn't have. That probably could be debated. There's something we took pleasure in, but we, we are all kind of pleasure junkies. We look for it in something, one thing or the other. Uh, but part of the problem is that oftentimes because we're sinners, we can find pleasure in things we ought not. In fact, the world acknowledges this. There was a survey done a couple years ago, and they titled it Guilty Pleasures. So these are things that people took pleasure in, though they knew that they really shouldn't. And it's just part of, again, the nature of human depravity. We find pleasure in things perhaps we shouldn't, like calling in takeout because we didn't want to make our food. Falling asleep, watching TV, sneaking an extra scoop of ice cream, everybody says amen, or creamy when you shouldn't. Uh, putting off a task, buying yourself a treat. We like to do that. We reward ourselves. Singing out loud in the car, because we probably shouldn't sing out loud otherwise. All right. Staying in your pajamas all day. McDonald's. Some people are sick. Anyway, uh, bring a whole TV, watching, binging on TV, watching it all day, listening to music that you listen to as a kid, people watching. That's always an interesting phenomenon, depending on where you're doing it. Um, eating an entire bag of chips in one sitting, they must be Lay's, right? Uh, all right. Watching Disney films and cartoons as adults, getting back to bed, uh, eating food in bed, checking social media when you should be working or studying. I think that could be studied in lots of companies today. Uh, eating cereal for dinner, I'm not really sure why you would do that. Um, here's a few others. This comes from psychological, uh, Psychology Today. 2019, Americans find their greatest pleasure in infatuation, whether it's with a, a person or an activity, obviously in the physical activity of sex, watching a big game, fun times with good friends, travel, being productive, watching a movie, hugging a child or a grandchild, uh, a, lovely, uh, a lovely walk, hike or drive, a lovely meal, a spa, a massage, reading a book. Now, some of those at the end were clearly in a pre-COVID-19 world. No hugging, all of that's got to be out. We've got an elbow bump or, you know, something, but anyway. So these are things that the world finds their pleasures in. Uh, they look for it. And we sang a text this morning, and we're going to be challenged this morning from the Word of God to consider where do we find our pleasures. What is it that thrills our soul? The fourth stanza of this song reads, uh, Every need his hand supplying, every good in him I see. On his strength, divine relying, he is all in all to me. And that probably is a great question for us. Is he really our all in all? Every good in Jesus I see. And that really is the title this morning, and it's a call to follow Jesus because, as we've been saying and really trying to flesh out, uh, what does it mean for Jesus to have the preeminence? What does it mean uh, that in all things he is to have preeminence? It means he is to come first. He is at first place in my affections, and my thinking, and my loyalty. Uh, that is what it means for Jesus to be preeminent. It also means he's better than everything else. Amen? He is better. 
We are all pleasure junkies. Here's the reality. We like our pleasure. We find it in various things. We can go search it. Uh, you know, my favorite creamy place has blueberry creamies this week. Uh, they've changed their flavors on Tuesday. You know what I'll probably do tomorrow? I'll probably have to go get one because it's my favorite creamy combination of all creamy combinations because I find pleasure in it. Now, we all find pleasure. Now, there's nothing wrong, per se, in finding pleasure in temporal things. There may be. Obviously, some things are sinful because we're still twisted and we're fallen. At times, we can find things in perverse, we can find pleasure in perversity. That is a part of humanity. We know that as a culture. We see it in our culture. We see a lot of things celebrated that ought never to be celebrated. I think we can agree with that. And because people are fallen, they will often find pleasures in things that are twisted and crooked that they should never, ever find pleasure in. Now, you and I are going to find pleasures. We're going to seek it. Now, part of our problem is we often believe that temporal things bring us greater pleasure than Jesus. And that is not true. And as long as we continue to allow the world and the temporal world around us to offer us trinkets and treasures, often one author put it this way, it's the puddles of pleasure. We jump around in little puddles, we splash around in them like they're going to make us happy, and really all they do is get us wet and dirty. When there's an ocean of God's joy to be swam in by the people of God, when we find our pleasures in Christ and our relationship with Christ, we begin to experience genuine joy that though we live in a fallen and broken world where we cannot escape pain. You cannot escape difficulty in this fallen world. This fallen world is filled with it. We'll face opposition. We'll face difficulty. We'll face various levels of persecution. We'll face being sinned against. We will sin against others. We will face the pain of living in a fallen world. We cannot escape it. But the great joy for a Christian is that in the midst of the pain of a fallen world, you have an inescapable source of joy that never changes. Jesus. So he is my all in all. He is the one that I am to find my greatest pleasure in. And thus, we find Paul uh, speaking to this issue. And I'm going to read verses uh, 2 and 6 and 7. That will be our focal point for this morning. As you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, there's the command, rooted and built up in him, established in faith, as you have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. And so like Paul does in chapter, did in chapter 1, when he throws out the big idea of, of, of walking worthy, Uh, In his prayer request in chapter 1, I'll show that to you in just a minute, he then followed up with an explanation. Same thing's happening here in 2, 6, and 7, where Paul is is making an admonition, this time in a form of a command, to walk in Christ, and then he's explaining what that looks like, really, with verse 7. So we'll see how that pulls together. But the first point is simply this. Following Jesus, which is what the call is to do, to continue to walk in him is to follow him, demands a submission to his authority. Remember who you receive. So Paul is pointing back, he's saying, listen, as you have, as this has happened in your life, what happened in their life? Well, the gospel came. The gospel came to Colossae. And the gospel came to Colossae through Epaphras. And, and think of all the things that happened to make that, that come true. I mean, Epaphras himself traveled to Ephesus, and he was there probably on business. He arrives in Ephesus, which is a trade city, and the apostle Paul is there preaching. He goes and he hears this apostle preaching and he actually is converted. He's saved. He stays in Ephesus for some time and then he goes back to Colossae. But now you've got to step back behind that. Well, how did Paul get in Ephesus? Well, who is Paul? who's Paul anyway? Well, he's that great apostle, right? Well, remember, he began as Saul the terrorist. He was a Jewish Pharisee who went out of his way to persecute Christians, even went to the religious leaders, got certificates of approval to go to foreign countries, arrest Christians, bring them back, throw them in prison, and even be approving unto their death. That was Saul. What happened to that guy? Well, that guy got stopped on the road to Damascus. He's on his way to go arrest Christians, and he gets stopped on the road to Damascus. Jesus himself appears to him, and he gets saved. Jesus saves him. He saves Saul on the road to Damascus, and then he goes to discipleship school. It was a private invitation to be discipled by Jesus himself. He spent time being discipled by Jesus himself. As you can imagine, that would be a pretty effective discipleship course. He comes out of that discipleship course on fire for the Lord, and he's now sent out by the church of Antioch to take the gospel to people who have never heard the gospel. And one of the cities he ends up in? Ephesus. One of the people he meets? Epaphras. Epaphras takes the gospel to Colossae. Isn't the gospel amazing? I mean, we could go around the room, and if you haven't done this yet, let me again give you a little admonition or a little challenge, a little uh, exhortation. Please take time to write out your personal testimony. If you don't have one, you need one. We can help you with that. 
Actually, I can't really help you with that. Jesus can. But we would love to see you have a personal testimony where you can share of the saving power of the gospel that changed your life. Now, you need, if you, you have experienced the love of God and salvation, then you have a testimony. You say, mine's not all that dramatic. Listen, friend, you were once dead and you're now alive. That's pretty dramatic. I, I, whatever the circumstances, we go all around the room. Uh, some of you are long-term Vermonters and you've got family history and you were raised in Christian homes and that's a wonderful blessing. Some of us are from all over the place and we can tell you our stories and when the gospel came to our life, but eventually, I mean, you have to come to this point that at some point, did you receive Jesus Christ, the Lord? Was there a time in your life where you actually humbled yourself, acknowledging your own sin, turning from it, and trusting Christ? Because they received. The gospel came to Colossae. What happened? The grace of God came to Colossae is what happened. When the grace of God came to Colossae, people started getting saved. Paul heard about it in a Roman prison, because remember, that's where he is while he's writing this letter. He's in a Roman prison. He hears about the gospel going to Colossae, people being saved, and what is the effect? Paul's rejoicing. You know, last week, I mean, just... uh, uh, just what it was on uh, I got the date uh, oh, sorry Etta was born uh, the Albert's baby was born uh, just the last week and so or what two weeks ago now is it two weeks yeah two weeks ago so we like birth announcements right I mean we do and I think we should uh, so uh, Ricky and Anna had a new baby and of course, we were all waiting for it. We knew when they went to the hospital, we're praying. Then you finally get the birth announcement and find out she's healthy, everything's good. We're all rejoicing. Now, we should rejoice in new life, right? Absolutely. Okay, we just got to see our grandchildren. We got to see our, our oldest grandchild just turned three. We've got a fourth one on the way in November. We're excited. All right, now, we should be excited about new birth, amen? All right, now, my question is, is are you more excited to see people spiritually born again? Are we excited about new birth in that way? I mean, the natural progression, I mean, healthy people are reproductive, physically speaking. If everything's right, there's going to be reproduction. We have children. We rejoice in that. It's a gift of God. We're thankful for it. And and here's the thing. God wants the church to be reproductive. Amen? Actually, God wants to give us new birth. Do you believe that? We're not sure. Maybe? Maybe? Maybe God, wants, maybe God wants me to be a fisher of fish. Maybe he wants me to be a fisher of men. Maybe the Spirit of God's actually at work in the people of God to help us open our mouths and share the gospel with other people. Maybe? Do you think that's a maybe? Okay, I hope you don't think that's a maybe. I think that's what Jesus actually promised to do. I will make you fishers of men. So if you're not fishing for men, you're not cooperating with what Jesus wants to do in your life. You're actually trying to be something other than what Jesus wants to make you. That's a problem, right? So Jesus wants to make us fishers of men, and he wants to give us fruit. He wants to open doors. He promises he will. He calls on us to come to him and ask him to open doors, give us boldness. And you know what? If you ask for an open door and boldness, you know what God's going to give you? Open doors and boldness. Amen. This is not hard. Okay? You ask for an open door, God's going to give it. You might miss it. And later go, whoa, that was an open door. I walked right by it. But you start praying for open doors, God's going to open doors. Amen? You start praying for boldness to share your faith. You know what you'll start doing? You'll start opening your mouth, and out will come words that you didn't even imagine you knew. You're going to start telling people things about the gospel. You're like, wow, that was pretty good. I heard that somewhere. I experienced that. I actually, well, I, where did that come from? And you're going to start sharing things that God's done in your life, and you're going to start sharing the gospel with people. And you know what happens? Here's the great thing. What happens when you actually start sharing the gospel with people? Here's the amazing thing. People will start getting saved. Born again. We just sang about that, didn't we? God's chosen child of mercy, born again. You know, as we take pleasure in sharing the gospel, God takes pleasure in, sh- in saving sinners. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. We get an opportunity to participate. Paul had an opportunity to participate. He was thrilled with what God had done in saving the people at Colossae and saving him. He rejoiced in it. He wanted them to rejoice in it. And, and, and he really uh, is excited about what God is doing. There's a wonderful picture in the Bible, and perhaps sometimes we don't think of it this way. But the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son is one we're very familiar with. But oftentimes we think of the prodigal son, as, I mean, it's the story of, of the ugliness of sin where he demands his way, takes his inheritance early, goes out and wastes it. 
And he comes to the end of himself in a pig pen, which is kind of ironic for a Jewish person, uh, to be in a pig pen. And he, he decides to go back to his father's house. And he said, listen, the servants of my father's house are better off than this. I'm just going to go back. And I'm going to tell my, I, I am, he is repentant. He's broken. Uh, he just wants a little mercy. And he's just asking for a little mercy. And he's coming home as repentant, broken by sin, to ask for mercy from his father. And here's this wonderful picture of how God receives sinners. The father runs to his son. He runs to the repentant sinner, rejoicing over his repentance, and welcomes him home. The self-righteous brother, on the other hand, is not so rejoicing because he represents all the religiously lost people in the world who think they're going to heaven through their own goodness or their own religion. They think their doing makes them more righteous than other people and more deserving, and those sinners like that brother does not deserve mercy and grace. They do. They don't really rejoice in Jesus being long-suffering. They want to see Jesus give them what they deserve because they don't think they deserve it. That's the nature of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is one of the greatest sinful deceits that's ever propagated on humanity. That somehow you can be right with God on your own merits. Folks, you cannot. But the great picture of the prodigal is of the father initiating and his initiating love to go receive the repentant son. And the Bible tells us the heavens rejoice over every sinner who trusts himself and goes his own way. No. The Bible says that heaven rejoices over every sinner who repents. And remember, repent fundamentally is a turn of direction. You can't keep rebelling against God and be repentant. You can't. Repentance is a turn of direction from sin back to God, and heavens rejoice. Now, here's the thing. Heaven doesn't just rejoice on the day you got saved. Heaven rejoices every time a sinner repents. Okay, the just are declared to live by faith. You are to live out the faith that you were given in salvation. That's what the command is. Continue to walk in him. Walk in him. So as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to walk in him. Walk, continue that idea of walk. is obviously not a physical walk. It's live your life in this way. Continue to live out your life as a relationship to Christ, meaning it controls what you think and what you do, how you behave. Both have to be controlled by the reality of who Jesus is. You need to continue living out that reality. And so the, the gift of faith given in salvation is one where to continue living. Well, part of that gift of faith is repentance, amen? But the day I got saved as a junior in college, I got on my knees in that college chapel, and I asked God to forgive me of my sin, to save me, and to help me to live for him. Change of direction, complete change of direction of life. And at that day of salvation, I turned from my rebellion against God, because all sin is ultimately rebellion, we want what we want, we'll do what we do, we are selfish at the core, that's my nature as a sinner, and in salvation that changes and our loyalty is shifted to Christ, we come under his authority and we begin following him, that's the nature of faith. Well, the faith that God gives you that you live by includes repentance, that means when you're sinning, and everyone in this room still sins, we are at best in this room sin saved sinners. Saved from the penalty of our sin and being saved by the power of God from the power of sin. Meaning sin doesn't have dominion in our life, though we still wrestle with it. So we are still sinners, and here's what sin always demands. Repentance. So when's the last time heaven's bells rang with rejoicing over you? Because some of us have brought this lie that only oh, that happened when I got saved. And the rest of the Christian life is about me living but heaven rejoices every time a sinner repents, even when saved sinners repent, amen? So when's the last time heaven rejoiced over you? Because the nature of salvation is I give up my rebellion to follow Christ. That's why Jesus said, if you're going to be my follower, you must deny yourself. You've got to stop believing you're good enough. You have to take up your cross, which means to come into submission of the one, the one against whom you've been rebelling. That's the whole imagery of cross work. Rome put the worst rebels against Roman authority on a cross. When Jesus said, take up your cross, he's not saying suffer. He's saying surrender. You've been a rebel against my authority, now surrender. You surrender to his authority and you begin to follow him. And that's the nature of the Christian life. And so following Jesus demands a submission to his authority. Paul would put it pretty clearly in Romans. He says, because if you confess with your mouth, uh, Jesus is Lord and receive in your heart, then 
I have a cataract growing in my right eye, so my distance vision really has gotten messed up. So I'm going to have to make my font bigger back there, but then it means like I'm going to get two words or something. I don't know. Anyway, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. With the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That idea of receiving Jesus Lord, obviously the text, and I'll back up just for a moment, because he says, as you therefore receive Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him. So he says in the language, and this is oftentimes one of the things, this is a little teaching moment, all right? So Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus the Lord, Lord and Christ are not names. Oftentimes we say Jesus Christ, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, like Lord, Jesus, and Christ. So first name, middle name, last name. We know it's not that, but we kind of throw it together like it's all a name. Paul says, as you received, literally, the Christ, the Christ, the anointed one, the king of Israel, as you received the Christ, who is Jesus, the Lord. So it's the Christ, the Lord. Who is that? Jesus. And so what he is saying is, remember who Jesus is. You receive Jesus for who he really is. He is the Christ, meaning he is the king of Israel, the rightful king, the anointed one of Israel. He is God's very promised son, the, the, the Emmanuel God with us. That's who Jesus is. He is the Lord, meaning he is fully God in human flesh. He is Yahweh. He is one with the Father. So remember who you've received and continue to live out that reality. He is indeed Lord. So continue to live it out, meaning as you live this life, what you think, how you live, reflects that he is your Lord. The world should know that we belong to Jesus, right? And all that we do and all that we say, the world should know that we belong to Jesus. That it's patently clear that our loyalties and our allegiance belong to Jesus. That means that as the world tempts you, and it will, the world will constantly tempt you to, to turn away from Jesus, to turn to other substitutes, to find pleasures and things you shouldn't find pleasure to. But when your loyalty is to Jesus, meaning you love him with all your heart, and you're rooted, we'll get to that, rooted and grounded in him, but as you continue to walk in him, live out that reality of faith, then the competitors aren't so competitive anymore. Because your loyalty and your love is so for Christ that you see through the thin veneer of sin's deception. So continue to live out that reality that Jesus is Lord. Live out that truth that he is your Lord. So continue to live in him. Continue. It's really a present. It's a command. It is the, my life is to be lived in this way as a continual demonstration of my love for Christ. And so we say with the songwriter, every, every good in Jesus I see. He is all and all to me. That brings us then to verse 7 and really the responsibilities given here. And it demands personal, so with submission, if we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to live in Christ, we have to come under his authority and live that out. And then what does that look like? Help me understand it. Well, that's what verse 7 begins to really do. And he really gives four different responsibilities. So these come in personal responsibility. But part of the interesting point put here, and I'll say it up front, and then we'll flesh it out as we work, is they're all put in, in what's called the passive voice. And in the passive voice, the emphasis there means that you can't do this alone. That you actually have to be rooted and grounded and strengthened or established by another. There's another agent at work, namely God. So they're called divine passes. It's a reflective of the fact that our sanctification, just like salvation was not my idea. My idea was to live for self. My idea was to be able to decide truth for myself. You know, the world has believed that lie, right? The world wants to define its own truth, have its own truth, live its own truth, and, and it believes, it believed the lie that they can define truth, but they cannot define truth. Truth is greater than people. Truth is transcendent, meaning it's greater. It actually has a source, and that source is God himself. And so what God has said is true. What men say may not be true. In fact, you can't really, even the Bible says our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? We can deceive ourselves. We can believe things to be true that are not true. And so the truth comes from God and his word. And that truth is what transcends all of reality. Everything else is just sheer craziness and folly. I mean, it's just like our world. I mean, we just stand here, and I'll just put this out there. No true Christian can accept abortion. Abortion is murder. End of story, always no exceptions. Because that's what the Word of God actually teaches. I know that's not what our culture teaches. I know it's, I'm not trying to be, make a political speech here. I have no interest in making a political speech. 
I simply have interest in standing on God's truth. My loyalty belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus says any taking of life like that, the innocent life, unborn life, is an act of murder. Okay, my daughter-in-law is pregnant. And you know what's inside of her? A baby. We've seen the picture. She's had two sets of ultrasounds. You know what that picture says? It's a baby. It's a human being. And she already has a name. She's a person, fully a person, made in the image of God. That life is to be protected. Christians have to stand there. Have to stand there. Or you are not walking in Christ. That's just truth. That's where we have to rest. And so what Paul does here, and I'm going to jump to this text, uh, back in chapter 1, Colossians, uh, Colossians 1, 10 and 11, Paul does a similar thing as far as how the language works and how it's constructed. And, and so in verses 1, 10, he's praying, and he uses this great rich phrase that he's praying that you would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. So here's my prayer, that you would walk worthy. Okay, well, what in the world does it mean to walk worthy, Paul? Well, then Paul goes on to explain it, right? Fully pleasing him, please him in all that you do. So to, be, to, to, be, uh, uh, to walk worthy, then Paul will explain, really in verse 11, he will flesh out what this worthy walk looks like. And so fully pleasing, fruitful in every good work, increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with might, uh, with all patience, the result being patience and long suffering. So he does a similar thing in Colossians 2, verse 7. He's really answering or explaining or expanding on the command. Walk in him, continue to live your life as Jesus is Lord. So continue to do that. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like being rooted and built. And now he moves to two metaphors, not difficult, one in agricultural world, one in the building world. So I wonder how many of, any of you plant a garden this year? You plant a garden, all right, so you plant the garden. So generally speaking, when you plant the garden, you probably just didn't walk out there to appear, some, some of the, the earth behind your home or the box, whatever you had, and just throw some seeds in there. I'm assuming you did something to prepare the soil. I mean, we planted all these wildflowers out here this year. We brought a tractor in, Pastor Randy's dad, plowed all that up, turned it all over. Uh, then we planted all the seed, and, and one of the things that we failed to do, we learned this lesson this year, is we didn't put any pre-emergence on there. Last year we had this sedge weed that appeared in our lawns. So as we plowed all this up, we kind of spread the sedge all throughout there. And so as everything began to grow, the sedge kind of came up there in the midst of all of our beautiful grass and beautiful uh, flowers. And so there's competing, this weed that's competing. So while it's really pretty and it's really nice, it's not quite as pretty and nice as it could have been. Because there's this competing, competitive weed that's trying to choke the life out of the flowers. All right, that's such a beautiful picture of what's going on in your life. At the day you got saved, you got rooted in Christ. That's Paul's use of the word here. He actually points backwards to point forward, and he says, at the day of salvation, you were rooted, you were established in Christ. Now keep on being rooted. The roots need to get deeper. They, they, you need to get rid of the competitive weeds. You need to uproot the unbelief that's still in your life so that you will remain rooted in Christ. You have a responsibility here, and what is that? To examine and find the unbelief that's still a part of your life and uproot it, get rid of it, put the weed control on it, kill it. By the Spirit, kill the deeds of the flesh. You need to kill the competition for your loyalty and love for Christ. Amen? The world's offering you all kinds of competitors. Satan wants to distract you, and he wants to destroy you. I think you know that. Here's the good news. You know what Satan cannot do? He cannot make you sin. I mean, that old adage, the devil made me do it, is a flat-out lie. The devil doesn't have that power. Aren't you glad? The devil can't make you betray Christ, amen? Greater is he who's in you than who's in the world. If you're in Christ, greater is Christ than the rest of the world. You don't have to sin. Isn't that amazing? The promises of God are true, fully true, fully trustworthy. Paul's saying be rooted in those. Remember, you still got unbelief in your heart. There's things you were taught that the world continues to offer you that are not true. But boy, they're persuasive. And boy, they're persistent. And they're going to try and bully you and intimidate you and beat you down and get you to be submissive and quiet because it's not politically correct to speak the truth. And the world's going to continue to fight you. But you're to be rooted in Christ. Be rooted in Jesus. And so keep pulling the weeds of unbelief up that you might be firmly established. Aren't you glad Satan can't uproot you? 
But you know, those weeds get there, though, don't they? And just like that sedge weed has impacted the growth of those flowers out there, or just like the bugs or the weeds have impacted your garden, or perhaps it was the deer that came in and ate it after it grew, just like the world is filled with competition for the fruit for your crop that you might be trying to raise, and aren't you glad that for most of you, you're not actually trying to make your living doing it? And aren't you glad for all those who do? And for all the work they do to take care of that crop and to make sure the weeds don't compete and destroy what they're there so they can bring forth a harvest for which all of us are blessed. And that's the imagery that Paul's using here. You and I have a responsibility to stay rooted in Christ, driving out the unbelief. And then that demands that we keep coming back to the Word of God, to throne of grace. That actually we believe we need help. Because remember, you can't root yourself. You didn't start the process, you can't really continue it, but you have a responsibility in it. So I am fully responsible to pursue being rooted while recognizing that I can't root myself, but only God can do that. That's what drives you to the Word. It makes you a student of the Word. That would change. Folks, if we really believe Jesus is better than everything else, it would change the way you study your Bible. For American Christianity today, we believe so many lies. There are so many lies that have perpetrated the church. So much so that the average American Christian is really satisfied with about one hour a week of service. And in that, they might get 30 minutes. And I know I'm the exception. I go longer than that. But, uh, you know, that we might. So even on a good day, I, I'm about 40, 45 minutes, all right? And for most of you, you're like, that's not a good day. That's a long day, Pastor. I get it. But we, we, we get about 35, 40 minutes of actual biblical instruction in our life, and we think we're going to be able to go out and compete with the world and the devil in our flesh. It's the height of our folly. It's the reason why the church is so weak. It's why it's so run over by the culture. It's why our culture is run over the church in America, and why our, 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 our country looks more like our culture around us than the church that's in our midst. In fact, the church in our midst is continually looking more like the culture around it than changing the culture around it by truth. Because we believe lies, that we simply need a little bit of Jesus and we are going to go to heaven. And and while if you have Jesus, you're going to heaven, but your response will be rooted in him. To know that the, the competing weeds of unbelief are there in our culture and they're going to suck the life out of you. And the fruit that you're supposed to, to bear is not going to be born as long as all those weeds are present. So be rooted, and not only rooted, but you're ultimately to be built up. And there's that building, building metaphor. So brick upon brick, just as you would lay block. I don't know if any of you are a mason or have ever helped out in building uh, with block work. I had that opportunity in Brazil a number of years ago. We were helping with the church construction, Hope Baptist Church in, in, in uh, Sorticaba, Brazil. And we were helping lay block. And we took some guys that that's their trade. They were really good at it. And then we had other guys that had been the hod carriers. So they're carrying the mortar, the, bl- the mud, the concrete mortar. So they were doing all the mixing. That was the hard, really hard work. They had to mix all that up because it was all mixed by hand. We didn't have a mixer. They're mixing it up. They're carrying it out to you. You're troweling on the mud. You're putting on the next block, putting on the next block. They're putting all these lines out there because we make sure that it's level. Then lines to make sure it's plumb. They let me be on one wall and start laying block. And so I'm getting some experience. And I'm putting blocks on and making sure, tamping them. And they're giving me all the measurements just to keep it because we want the wall to be straight and not leaning out and not crooked. And we're doing all of that to have have a nice straight wall that will both be secure and pretty. Now, the mason's on this side. He's going, and I'm thinking I'm finally getting some speed, and I get done with my row, and I look over, and he's done three. Three rows, and I did one. I'm like, man, your wall's going to be a lot taller than mine. This is the short people side of the church. That will be... Uh, so we're laying block, and they let me do that, but they checked everything and continued to check, and I got some experience at that. And so this whole idea of building upon building and keep it straight, precept upon precept, truth upon truth, here's this demand. You've got to know God's Word. You've got to live out the truth of God's Word. You've got to know that what you're actually doing and believing actually matches what God has said. Stop just believing a culture around you. Get in the Bible. When people tell you something that's not true, challenge it. Don't just accept it. Don't let them bully and intimidate you. You've got the truth on your side. Dig in. Know the truth. Speak the truth. It'll open up amazing opportunities to witness. Don't let them bait you for an argument. I make that mistake far too often. 
Okay, I'm far too often, I'm easily, I'll jump down that argument trail. Okay, it doesn't work, okay? I'm never going to argue anybody into heaven. I just need to love them into heaven, but, but I need to speak the truth. And we need to speak the truth into their lives. But you, don't, you can't speak the truth in anybody's life if you don't know it. It's built up in Christ. The only way that happens is through the Word of God. Changing the way you think, so you think God's thoughts after him. That's the great goal of the Christian life, is to be sanctified in mind and attention, so you're actually built up. Jude was just a solid warning letter. He ends this warning letter with this admonition. Beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. There's that divine passive again. Keep yourselves. You keep on keeping yourselves in the love of God, but only God can actually keep you there. But be built up by the truth, by the word of God. Keep being built up. It is the word of God that builds us up in the faith. And so we need that building continually. Uh, then we must be strengthened to live by faith. That's the third admonition, established in the faith or becoming established. And the idea here is to move beyond doubt. As James would said, those who are doubting, people who pray with doubting are unstable. The double-minded man is an unstable man because he tries to live a two-souled life. He tries to live loyal to Christ, yet live with his hands in this world. So he believes the lies of the world, what life's about, and he tries to believe in Christ, but that leads to just total instability because one moment he'll be loyal to Christ, the next moment he's disloyal to Christ because he's following the world. So James says don't be like that. Paul is saying be established, move beyond doubt. And so that demands really this one cannot be true without the first two being true. As you're rooted in driving out unbelief and built up by the truth of the word of God, you will be firmly established in the faith, unmoving. Aren't you glad that you can take your stand against sin? Aren't you glad that no matter how much changing the culture continues to change and truth seems to be eroded and what our country used to believe about sexuality that gets changed and what our country believes about this or about that, about what's being taught, actually the truth hasn't changed? God hasn't changed? What it means to please God hasn't changed? You do not have to be driven with the winds of change of your culture. You don't have to go that way, amen? Amen. You can be firmly established in your faith because God will do that by the ministry of the Spirit through the Word. And you can be beyond doubt. Isn't that good news? Folks, I don't ever get up in the morning and wonder if the world was a cosmic accident. There's not one day, I, there's not one day when, I, I mean, when bad things happen and the difficulties come, I can be honest enough to say, I don't always rejoice. That's not always my first response. But I can tell you this, I don't say this was an accident. This is all a part of a divine design. It's all part of God's, God's accomplishment and his purposes. And this is what I have to then speak truth. Because either I can listen to myself, and if I listen to myself, I become a complainer. You guys all know people like that, right? You know people, when you meet them, they start down the list of all the things that are wrong in their life. All the ways they've been victimized, everything that's wrong, and they begin to complain. And you're pretty soon like, you just can't wait to find an excuse to leave. Because you've heard all the complaints, and it's like, boy, this is so uplifting. I just want to hear one more. Could you give me one more, please? Oh, thank you. Now I'll go over here, and you know what we do? We walk away and go, boy, I'm glad I'm not like that, and then we complain. We do. It's our nature. It's just what sinners do. And here's where, where Paul is saying you need to be firmly established, rooted down in the faith so you're not blown around by all the winds of change in a culture. You can stand on truth, find your joy in Christ, and be unmoved by the difficulties of life. Aren't you glad that can be true of your life? I am. I'm so thankful to know that my God is good and he's always doing good. Even in the darkest days and the difficult hours of my life, when I want to complain and when my selfishness, I want to say it's not fair and I don't deserve this and all the things that I want to speak to myself and I want to listen to that, I need to preach to myself. No, my God is good. He is sovereign and he is in control and he is doing good. And we need to be abounding in thanksgiving and perhaps that really went better with my illustration about complaining. Because we really should. One of the solutions and one of the ways you protect yourself from false doctrine about yourself, your sanctification, uh, from the world around you, all the vain ideologies. Remember, this is all in a context of don't allow false teaching to influence you. Don't allow the world filled with false things to, to take you captive in your thinking. Don't do it. You received Christ who is Lord. Remember who's Lord. It's not the world around you. 
It's not science, whatever science is. Science is like this ubiquitous, all-knowing being, but it's not. Science is observational. Hello, there's a God in heaven who created everything, and that's the only reason why there can be science. Amen, scientists? Thank you, Chris. But one of the solutions to false doctrine is to have a rejoicing heart. You know, I, I, there's a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. Probably my wife posted it, and I just copied it from there. But I love this quote. She says it this way, It's always possible to be thankful for what is given rather than resentful for what is withheld. It's always possible to be thankful for what is given rather than resentful for what is withheld. One attitude or the other will become your way of life. Just like we all like to move away from the complainers, the question is, is whether our attitude is ruled by the things we think are withheld from us or whether our attitude is really dominated by thanksgiving. You know, every morning you can get up and be thankful. You say, but pastor, you don't know the difficulty I'm facing. We don't know each other's difficulty unless we share it. That's why we're called as a body of Christ to share our burdens one with another. That's why we're called to care enough, care actually more about the burdens of others than ourselves. So that we can weep with those who are weeping, we rejoice with those who are rejoicing. But here's the thing, no matter what is going on in the difficulties of life, every morning as a child of God, I have a reason to rejoice. Because you know what? Jesus rescued me from sin. Jesus died on a cross to take my place. He took my place on the cross of Calvary. It's reading. I'll share a little bit more about this tonight. But uh, you ever think about Barabbas? Because Barabbas was in jail. He was a terrorist, committed murder. Pilate under the press is like, I know my out. I'll offer him Barabbas. They'll take Jesus. And then they didn't. Can you imagine being Barabbas sitting in that jail, knowing you're about to be executed justly due? And when the soldiers come and you hear the chanting outside, crucify him, crucify him, you think that's you. And you know you deserve it. And when they open up the jail and they call your name, you're like, here I'm going, I'm going to death. They bring you outside, everybody's yelling, crucify him, crucify him. You think that's my death sentence. And then they unlock the shackles on you and say you're free. Do you think Barabbas got the point that Jesus died in his place? Do you? You see, we are so prone to complain like somehow I deserve something better. You know what I am? I'm Barabbas. You know what you are? You're Barabbas. Guilty, deserving of nothing but judgment. And Jesus Christ died for you. He took your place on the cross of Calvary. He carried the cross you and I should have carried. He died that death and took our place. Every morning I get up as a child of God, I have reason to rejoice. Every morning I have reason to be thankful. I'm to be rooted in the promises of God and claim them. And so I'm to come to a throne filled with grace, knowing that God will give me the grace to strengthen me. I'm to come to a throne filled with wisdom and ask God for wisdom, which he delights to give. I'm to come to that throne of grace filled with thanksgiving because thanksgiving will keep me from being a complainer. It'll keep me from looking for pleasures that are greater than Jesus because there are none. He is all in all to me.